All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wellness Wednesday. I have a lovely guest with me, Miriam Naval, today, um, who's going to talk about the healing power of tea. Um, she's the founder of Tea Salon, and the New York Times dubbed her the tea guru of New York. So she's a wealth of knowledge, and I'm really excited to pick her brain. Um, so, Miriam, you have a really interesting background. Uh, you started in fragrance as a nose. Um, I also used to work in fragrance, so I know what that means. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what that was and how it led you to tea? Okay, well, let's see. Um, I started a shop similar to the body shop as we know today, and that started in 1975 in New York. And uh, I made fragrances and perfumes and lotions and bubble baths and all that for years and years. And then uh, one day I just said, okay, I think I'm going to take a break, which I did. And I landed up working on a friend of mine's uh, video production who introduced something as we know high definition. Mm. Introduction of the first high def videos. And I worked on Billy Joel, Cindy Lauper, Herb Alpert. And in the middle of Herb Alpert's video, he said, you know, I heard that you're a nose. And I said, yes. And I thought he was some guy from, you know, Mexico, you know, playing the trumpet. Tijuana Brass, you know, the whole thing, and I found out in the middle of it that he owned A&M Records, and he was very serious about launching the first celebrity perfume, which now everyone's doing. Oh, my God. So who was the first celebrity? Him. Oh. He did a fragrance called Listen, and he said, would you move out to California? I said, are you crazy? I live in New York. I, I, I can't just pick myself up and leave. And he sent me a... Uh, uh, a ticket to see a and M's lot. He sent me a ticket on MGM's flight. I went across to California. I sat down with the whole family, and he proceeded to say, we're serious. So I ended up moving to California, launching a fragrance company, put it into all the stores. We sold it, and I moved to uh, my dream world. I moved to Florence, Italy. So I always, I'm a painter by heart which is really in my soul. I graduated studio arts and Lorenzo de' Medici. and So I went to school in Florence. And at the same time, my sister was about to get engaged and married to an Englishman. She said, I would like the whole family to come to England to meet my husband-to-be over afternoon tea. I said, wow, you know, nice Jewish girl from New York. We don't do afternoon tea. It's just not on our profile. Was this your first afternoon tea on record? I think so. I think it was. Yeah, it was like 28 years ago. It was my first tea on record. I mean, you know, I mean, it wasn't Katz's Deli. It wasn't a New York thing. And uh, so I found it really beautiful. You know, the three tears came out and the scones and the Devon cream and the jam and the tea sandwiches and the whole thing. And we sat and introduced ourselves and had afternoon tea. Everything was fabulous except the tea. The tea was horrific. It was like this black wash water. And I told my sister's mother-in-law, trying to be polite, you know, us New Yorkers are a little rude. As <laughs> never, never. You know, a little rude. And so I, um, I said to Esther, you know, Esther, I think everything is so elegant and beautiful. Thank you so much. But I think the tea could be worked upon. And she said, I heard you're such an entrepreneur. I bet you could make a good cup of tea. So I did. I took my daughter and I, we traveled to different countries, and we drank tea. And we realized the whole world drank tea under sickness, health, everyday habits, whatever it was. They woke up in the morning, and they drank a cup of tea. But Americans at that time, it wasn't part of the realization. They went to Chock Full of Nuts or wherever. Starbucks wasn't even happening yet. Or it was just beginning. Howard just started uh, being in, in the West Coast. And the rest of the world was drinking coffee in the morning. And their realization is that, why should I wake up to a cup of tea? So I came back, and I was going to open up the cutest little shop. Ooh, so sweet with a little bell and, you know, the whole thing. And one thing led to another. 5,000 square feet later, I opened the largest tea salon in the world below the Guggenheim Museum in Soho. Don't ask. Out to lunch. 257 seats, 40-foot bars, sushi, tea mixing, tea blending, Earl Grey chocolate cake, 
brunch no, is tea. Tea all around tea. Five thousand square feet of tea. And all of a sudden, I was that was it. I was Deb from Florence Fabrican, the guru of tea, the queen of tea. I became internationally famous by being stupid and opening up the largest tea room in the world. And it turned out to be historical. And that began the world of tea for me and the rest of the world started dancing in the song of it. And you know, I started getting that tea was another alternative. It just wasn't Twinings, Lipton, Bigelow. It was maybe there was a creative way of staying healthy, being conscious, being well, without having to do with just a cup of coffee. Interesting. Okay, so I want to fill in some of the gaps in your journey in terms of how you learned to blend tea oh and taking your perfume stuff. But I also want to make sure that we focused on, you know, the healing aspect of tea. And I know that you worked with Donna Karen on an amazing, amazing initiative um, called Urban Zen, mm -hmm. uh, where you served tea to, you know, very ill people. With was it just cancer or? Well, first of all. Her husband, Stephen Weiss, was dying of cancer, how it started. And she brought him to the hospital, and at the hospital bed, they were serving him twining, jello, and farina. And he, she was beside herself, beside the visual aspect of the room, which he immediately redecorated. You know, I mean, she really got, and she started bringing in everybody in her power. From Joan Halifax, Pamela Miles Reflexology, you know, all the oils and essentials, all the people that did aromatherapy, you name it. Every yoga, Rodney Yin, and, and everybody she could possibly bring in to save her husband's life and me. And so she got that the hospitals needed to up the bar. She got that they weren't really, really about the living. They were really about the dying. And she wanted to make a difference in the whole wellness arena of being well. And of course, Stephen passed, but in his passing, she got to see how many things could be shifted and changed in the world of wellness. So she started something called Urban Zen, and she had this big facility that her husband worked out of at, at Greenwich in Manhattan. And she started putting out the word that she would like to train 100 to 200 people on how to go into hospitals, serve them, be with them bring wellness into their moment of bleakness. And so for one year, I bartered. I, you know, she had everyone, which they were great. There were doctors and nurses and psychiatrists and Zen masters. And they all came and did this training. We meet once a month for three or four days, then once every few months for a week. And I said, you know, I mean, I'd love to do it. I personally didn't have the financing at the time, but let me barter, which I did. And I served my tea every month for three days, sometimes four days, three to four times a day to this beautiful, unbelievable group of really heartfelt teachers that are learning more to comp to bring into their lives, to bring into their 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 places of business, to put into hospitals, to put into their wellness centers. And so I learned a lot. I met an amazing group of people that I'm still close with. And that kicked me off. But at the same moment I'd like to interject that my sister was just uh, found ovarian she just had ovarian cancer. They just scanned her. They found it. And it was another opportunity. I hope you're drinking tea with that cup. Yes, but I don't know if you'd approve of it. Oh, it's green. God, I just can't believe it's not my tea. All right, we won't look. I haven't gotten it yet. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, any. I'll send it ASAP. So, um, so my sister's in the hospital. I'm doing Urban Zen. She gets her ovar ovaries taken out. She's in the middle of New York Hospital, and they give her a cup of twinings and jello again and I'm looking this can't be happening to my own family so I immediately brought in juices I really brought in my a, a list of healing teas that I've been working on for the last year and slowly but surely it's been seven years I can't tell you my sister's teas healed her but I think it healed this I think it healed her heart I think it healed her head 
I think there was something in there, in that moment of compassion, of her drinking my wellness teas, that she felt she was blanketed in comfort, that she was secured in some way that it may sh I was making a difference and this cup was making a difference in her life. So, um, you know, and since then, she's been, she just did chemo, and I've been putting it out there into the world of spas and wellness centers across the world. And I so tell me, tell me a little bit more about how you developed the blends, what they are. Um, had you done any kind of research prior to uh, Urban Zen experience about the healing nature of tea? Of course. Well, let's start with when you're dealing with an internal affairs, which I'm in the internal affairs business, meaning you put this cup into your mouth. When you do that, you're dealing with the Federal Drug Administration, you're dealing with the universe, you're dealing with the Almighty. You're not dealing, you can't just put a product out in the air on just your good looks. You really have to do your due diligence. You really have to really get your paperwork in order and how they balance each other, each herbs, and how each one reflects another and how do they stimulate the hot and cold spots of your body and how do they work with your diet and digestion. So I went to India and I went and, and I just so happens I did it in two counts. I went to India because I was invited through the Tibet house to be part of 50 people to be with the holiness in New Delhi. <laughs> so we did 10 days with the Dalai Lama and 10 days of me researching herbs with Ayurvedic doctors in India that would work with the American and the global population in a, a way of getting it in a safe place, a fair trade way, organic way, a natural way, and that it would make sense for the American public to understand it. So I spent ten, you know, all this time back and forth, back and forth from India, and I came up with about 12 teas, now there's 10, of 12 to 10 teas that, you know, people call me every, like, right now my emails are filled with anti-cold, because we're about that season between... Yes, I wanted, that was one of my questions for you as well. <laughs> so, you know, they, they now the emails are anti-cold, immunity... I'm always getting my, you know, uh, good night, Irene, because people are always having sleep issues. And I have um, losing weight, you know, lose it. People are always, you know, you're not going to lose weight. You're not going to, but it does make a difference on the, the whole picture of how you do it. You know, it's not going to completely put you to sleep, but it does relax the moment. It definitely takes you into that comfort of sitting back and all of a sudden everything else around you gets quiet. But it's also about your diet. It's you know, you can't add one thing that will create you to lose weight. It's gotta be your whole lifestyle. It's gotta be everything and how do you get your immune system back? It's your whole lifestyle. So each of my herb collections that I add into it. Let's see, what do I have here? Like, this is balance. Mm. So that's like a goodie that we sell on the shelves in Fairways and other stores. So balance. Peppermint, chamomile, blackberry leaves, ginger, cinnamon bark, licorice root, roses, and marigold. It's like a balance. So you get the chamomile to relax the whole thing. Peppermint to work on your stomach. And licorice root is famous for just working on all the parts of your stomach, too. So I make each one work on each other, you know, and I think that it works, you know. I mean, I get phone calls. I get great phone calls. I get, I have very, teetotalers are really interesting characters. They are. They're a tribe onto their own. And when they get, you know, like wine people, if they love a good wine, they have it on their shelves. Tea people, when they love a good tea and they really feel for it and they're connected to it, they become your, like I have a, a long list of celebrity characters that when they travel, if they don't have it in their suitcase, like Andy Slater, for example, he manages Bob Dylan's uh, son's band. 
God forbid, when he's at the Four Seasons in New York and he doesn't have his tea, it's like you would think he was like a junkie. He's not. He just loves to make sure that his tea source is there and that he has his three to four cups a day and it keeps him even keeled. So, you know, so it's, it's like a meditative thing for a lot of people. Oh, of course. I mean, you've never seen any Dalai, you've never seen any monks drinking an espresso. I mean, that's not their, that's not what's going on in their life. What's going on in their life is they need to sit for hours. They need to be in that quiet place. They need to have something that will keep them alert and are there and being there in their seat, but also not giving them that edge that something else with that charges them out of the room. No, tea is 5,000 years old. I didn't invent tea. It's Camellia senescens. Once a tree, now a bush, picked every seven days. So Camellia senescens is we know tea. Then there's the whole line of herbal teas. That's a whole other category. That's to do with a whole other sector of the tea world, you know. Um, and those are really respected right now. There's lists and lists of everything from just a plain peppermint to a plain chamomile. I mean, those are just herbs grown in Morocco that we transport into this country. And peppermints grown in Northeast America, Oregon, Washington, that we get. So, you know, um, it's a fascinating business. And it's just, it's a $2 billion business last year. Opal Winfrey stepped into it last year. Like, I was her pick last year for the best iced tea, green coconut. Mm. And Howard made her an offer at Starbucks that I will make you a chai and I will give the funds to your African school. It was hard for her not to take that proposition. Even how much I begged her to do it with me, we talked about it. But he's a bigger, you know, he his return on her investment of time was extraordinary. And she's really into her schooling, you know, taking care of her kids in school. So, you know... The industry is tremendous. It's one of the la second largest after water in the world. Second largest globally in the world. So, you know, I mean, we're in an industry that really, that you, if you pay attention and listen to, it can change your vibrational tone. Mm -hmm. So, I want to talk about some specific ones. I want to hear a little bit about your anti-cold blend, just for people at home who are... Oh, anti-cold. I'm going to have to go grab it. Do you have a second for me to go grab it? No, don't go grab it. That's silly. Okay, okay. We'll, re we'll retool here. Okay, um, what do I, I feel like when people talk about, you know, superfood teas, green tea always comes up. That's, I think, in the wellness space, the most popular. What is um, it? you say green tea? Yeah. Would you agree or disagree that it should be at the forefront of everyone's? Well, here it goes. All tea starts green. All tea comes from the same bush. All tea is grown in hot, high climate. There is geographically places in the world that only prefer to grow green tea. Japan, some parts of China. But all tea starts green. It's the process they put it to. Even green tea is processed. Fermented, withered, rolled, and steamed in some parts of Japan. So it's fresher, it's less processed, high in caffeine. Don't you think for a moment that you're drinking green tea and there's not an alert button that says, good morning, America. You know, it is alive, it is well, and it works really well with some people in their system. Black teas to some people, the tannic in it, when they ferment, wither, and roll, it gets darker and darker and darker and richer and richer. So all the minerals and the things are held inside. And a lot of people can't deal with all that tannic. And green tea is a lighter, softer, feather-like, smoother taste that is really elegant when it's grown in the right places in Japan. Uh, we just we bring our teas in fresh out of Japan because we just launched the new park hide on 57th and they were adamant about the quality of their very expensive hotel rooms that they're in their room service they wanted the best so I had to do my due diligence and make sure that I got which I always carried the best but I had to 
really notch it up. And green tea, when it's drunk, is just divine. It's just soothing to the soul. You know, it has an enormous kind of like, hi, thank you for visiting me again. You know, that kind of introduction. But in terms of kind of like the ancient efficacies, efficacies that people talk about, it's not necessarily that green tea is necessarily healthier for you than a lot of the herbal varieties, but it may be more so than black tea because it's not as processed? Yes. Herbs, have not, again, have nothing to do with Camellia sinensis. You have to remember you're talking about uh, a bush against herbs. Herbs have no caffeine. Yes, yeah, some of them, like ginger, will charge you a different way. Like licorice will charge you a different way. There are many herbs that, when they're put together, have a, a interesting reflection on your body. But tea is tea. It has caffeine. I mean, you unless it's water processed and caffeine is water processed and steamed out, you are drinking a cup of caffeine. And caffeine, to some people, just don't work. Pregnant women people that are high prone to energy levels that are high already, that are like wired to the max, I mean, they'll have two cups of green tea and they're like, you know, they'll close a deal in a half an hour, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, green tea is, is, is thousands of years old. I mean, the Japanese and the Chinese have been drinking it for centuries. They still don't drink black tea, some of the Chinese, you know. What are some of the, t just for people who may not know, what are some of the medicinal pur like purposes or efficacies of green tea? Great for filtering the liver. Great for working on your kidneys. Great for chlorophyll. Remember you're dealing with green. Think of all the things that happen when you're in the woods. Have that moment of standing right now in the woods with all that pine and greenness around you and feel you see yourself sitting in a meadow of green. Your whole lung structure opens up and you can feel the fresh air around you and feel the elegance of all that chlorophyll that just enters into your capillaries. Green tea does exactly that. You're dealing in a green color which is immediately reflects what's going on in your brain beside money. We'll take that back. Beside money. It still has a greenness around you. That's why you love green drinks. That's why it's great when you do a cleanse and you start with a vegetable green drink. That's why the juices are so popular. They're green. And that greenness represents freshness. And green tea represents just that. It's fresh. It's alive. It works on your lungs. Lungs. A lot of lungs. Works on the capillaries of your lungs. When I served Ground Zero for two months, down when the buildings came down, I was there for the second day. I got a fax from the mayor that said, please come and serve what's going on down here, and I did. I came with food, I came with tea, and I came with green tea. Because I knew that the dust around us, they were all wearing masks, and the bodies and the buildings and the clarity, they, they didn't get it. The firemen wanted their coffee. You know, they were there, a McDonald's rolled up with a truck, they were getting free burgers, coffee was being poured, but out of one out of a hundred would walk over and go, I need a cup of green tea, because they knew it was getting healed. And then it started to get, you know, they got it. You know, they, not, they didn't trust that not only was green tea going to heal them, that green tea was going to keep them alert. They didn't believe that tea had that juice behind it to say, I got to go in there and pull out bodies, which they were doing, and, and pieces of the building and trying to clear the dust of what was going on in, in this horrific period of our moment. So, you know, green tea is a really, it's, I didn't, I'm just holding the torch for the next generation. You know, green tea is thousands of years old. The Chinese still drink it every day. The Japanese, it's their ceremony of life every morning. So are most of your wellness blends herbal or green or a mixture of the two? Are any of them black? No. No black teas. I think when you're dealing with a cleansing effort, I think it's important to have uh, herbs. And I do a healing heaven which is one of my first popular healing teas, which has everything in the kitchen sink. I, I didn't miss out on it. I figured if I'm going to heal with the heavens, I'm going to throw everybody in, which I did. It has like a thousand parts to it. You'll find it on my website at teasalon.com. And you see it and you drink it. It has a hint of 
Pamutan, which is a white kind of green tea that I threw into it. But most of my wellness teas, I have to admit, have all herbs in it and no green tea. What's your favorite, like, all-purpose wellness tea ingredient? Um, there's a lot. Cat, cat, uh, uh, St. John's wort. Um, there is marigold flowers, ginseng. Um, I mean, the list is long. I must have, like, 40 in my arsenal of herbs that I work with that I throw together. Like, right now... I just, someone just called in for a, um, a Christmas healing tea. So I did last night lemon verbena, marigold flowers, sunflowers, and hibiscus, and a little bit of rose hip. So I threw that because of its red, and it's, and it's holiday, and all those components, vitamin C on rose hip, hibiscus for the tartness that really works in dealing with your liver and kidney, and, you know, and I'm sure I've made some mistakes that a million people will Twitter me in the next, you know, 55 minutes. You forgot? How come you didn't mention? Hey, I forgot a few things. I am sorry. But, you know, as a whole, you know, I, I do have a, a, an array of teas that I, of herbs that I carry from orange pieces to coriander to black and white peppercorns to anise to licorice to uh, lemon verbena, peppermint. Uh, I carry all those 24-7. I have them all here. And lavender, really good for sleeping. Mm. Mm. So if someone was feeling under the weather at home and didn't have access to all of your amazing blends, had just a very rudimentary selection of basic teas by one ingredient, what would you recommend to them? Chamomile. I'd recommend chamomile as first for soothing the whole element of your vibrational tone. If you want to bring your vibrational tone in and you just want to have it a little clarity and you want to brighten the colors around you, I think that I would definitely first start with chamomile and peppermint. Easy to get to, a no-brainer. If you want to spice it up, I throw a little pepper into it. I would throw a little anise into it for the fall season. I mean, I would work. I'm not a cinnamon person, but a lot of people love to make, you know, uh, a chai that's a... You know, um, um, it's an herbal chai that a lot of people like to make up. They use peppercorns, red peppercorns, white peppercorns, cinnamon, anise, and they steep it for like an hour all together, and, and they make that. Uh, I'm personally, a, some, I hate to say it, I'm a, I'm a black tea kind of girl. You know, I mean, I'm sitting with my queen of earl right now. With that first afternoon tea. I love it. I, I You know, I'm not an Earl Grey fan. And when I was asked to do, uh, for somebody uh, very well known, they wanted Earl Grey, and I said, okay, let me work on it. So I worked on it, and I added a little molasses crystals into bergamot, the Italian lemon. That was it. I came home, and now I'm addicted. It's terrible. I do get addicted. I stay for about three months in that party. I really need to hear it, smell it, drink it, goat milk it, 2% milk it, almond milk it, whole milk it, alone, leave it alone, I chill it, I serve it iced at Brooklyn, uh, uh, Brooklyn Roasting and at the uh, Park Hyatt on 57th, they ice it now, so you get it iced in the hotel, 92 floors. So it's pretty, you know, and then, like, the fall's coming, so, you know, you have to ch look at your holiday blends, which we're getting ready for right now. How many cups of tea do you drink a day? You have a lot of energy. I do. Um, <laughs> I think that it's crystallized in my entire capillary system of 23 years. I don't think it's how much I drink in a day. But I will say this in my wellness being of who I am, which I have grasped and gotten. I don't come from a healthy family. My father died of cancer. My mother died of rheumatoid arthritis. My sister has cancer. I have two other sisters. And I'm going to say this, and I'm only going to say this out of my belief system and who I am. I think the reason I'm here today and living a healthy and vibrant life. Why? I just think that it gives you energy. It's nothing like coffee. 
Now, I don't say I never drank coffee. I drank plenty of coffee. I lived in Florence, Italy. I drank espressos in my breaks every day. Cafe Latte was my middle name. But I think that there's some clarity to tea that's really clear in your membranes, in your system, that you think really clearly. And you're not on a high slope, then skiing downhill, then getting on another mountain, and then skiing downhill. Tea is a very even keel. There is something about it, that's why these meditators and yogis, if they're smart, not all of them, I have a few yogis that are famous that always drink their coffee, will not mention any names. But you can't out people like that, not in this program. No, you can't, because they are, they're great at what they do. They're amazing, they're brilliant. They bring the well-being to thousands of people. And they start their day with a cup of coffee. And there's millions that wake up every morning and need their cup of tea. And I, when I first start doing the first fancy food show, introduced my teas in 1994, there was eight of us, eight people in a room of the fancy food show. Do you know how many people there are today? Tell me, Miriam. 287. That's great. Coffee and tea show in Philly, November 6th and 7th. I'm not doing it. I'm doing the Philly Fancy Food Show coming up October 18th. I called them yesterday and I said, I'd, <clears throat> I always do it. I go, well, what's going on with the show? She goes, well, we have 50 tea people and 20 coffee people. The show is called Coffee and Tea Show. The movement has begun. Well, it's begun a while now. I mean, I think it's it's been about the last... Hmm, I'd say 12 years. And Appa Oprah did her signature with Starbucks on her chai. That was it. Like, she got you to see. It all comes back to Oprah. So I want to circle back on some of your travels uh, before we wrap up because we only have a couple more minutes left. Um, what's the most interesting medicinal thing you learned about tea when you were going around the world? I learned that it's just not one component that does it. I think it's really about the whole, the things you add to it. I mean, I can drink a cup, when I get cold, like a cold or which is rarely do, I have to admit, I sorry to say this, but I don't get colds. But when I do go down for the count, I'll make a pot of ginseng and, and ginger. I'll take ginger, I'll slice it fresh right there, and I'll slice it almost like, enough to fill the bottom of a of a big teapot you know and I will drink it all day long and I feel that it's really went into the system it's gone into my immune system and I learned that that ginseng is global it's just not in New York it's just not in China it's also all over the world that you go to in Thailand when I drank there in Russia you know and to, when I went to uh, Bangkok you could see them pulling off the ginger and just slicing it for you and adding some other concoctions, which I didn't do. I said, it's okay, I'll just have the ginger. Um, I loved, I went to Morocco and I loved their ritual of the sweet mint tea and how they poured it. Do you have any favorite place in the world for tea in terms of just the rituals around it? I do. I did have the pleasure of going to Darjeeling. It is 14,000 feet up. It's the champagne of tea, champagne of tea, because all tea is grown and you pick it every seven days. But in Darjeeling, you're at the base of the Himalayas. Because it gets so cold, the tea bushes go to sleep. And during the winter, it's quiet. But then they wake up in the spring and the women flush out the first buds in April. And if you're there, the ground, the sweetness of the smell, and I've been there, and that to me, sitting on Tiger Hill, watching the sun come up in the morning at 14,000 feet up, is mind-boggling. The clouds, the mist of the clouds goes through your face. You can feel a cloud pass your body if you're that high up. And to me, and they all wake up in the morning. Everybody lives on the land of Darjeeling. The family lives there, the growers, the family that picks the children, the hospitals, the schools, all live on the estates. So you wake up and you're there as a guest. It's 5.30, bells go off, 
they all go into a morning meditation. They all put their baskets on their back, the scarf over their head, and they do it the way you would have seen pictures a hundred years ago. They go up into the fields and the women do the business. They pick all the leaves by hand. I mean, mind-boggling to think what's in your cup. This thousands of women, which are the goddesses as we know, picking your leaves. And then they're all of a sudden they're packed and withered and rolled in a certain climate and timing. Each Darjeeling estate, only 87, have a secret formula of how long they dry their leaves for. And they keep it under like lock and key. I found Darjeeling to me most magical place I've ever been to because you're also near Tibet. Is there like in the same way with wine that terroir matters so much? Is it more the climate or the soil that the tea is grown in or more the processing you think that affects oh, the vinyl? The climate and the soil. The soil, the soil is hundreds and hundreds of years old. So you're looking at a family that has taken over generation after generation. Now there's one estate, he's a real character, I've been there, Makabari. Now Makabari, the colonel of Makabari estate, takes gems, crystal gems, grinds them down and pours it into the estate. He feels that it'll do a vibrational tone to bring the tea leaves into, like when you drink it, it's almost like a holy experience. No, really, really, they do that. And each one of them, I mean, really takes it to heart. I mean, this is their livelihood. This isn't a hobby, as my accountant calls my business. <laughs> I hope that you make money this year. Your third year of a hobby after 23 years. Oh but, my God! I know, I know. But and I will tell you, it's 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 not a hobby to them. This is their morning wake up. They meditate. They go up into the fields. They take breaks. They now have fair trade. They now have bathrooms. They now have gloves when they do it. They they really have up the ante of what organic means, what fair trade means. They really make it a very loving, endearing experience, and you love being part of it. Can we actually talk about that for a second? Because in general, I think all sorts of food and beverage labels confuse people. What should everyone at home look for when they're buying tea in the regular store if they can't find tea salon, which is obviously what they should buy? Well, right. So this is what we look like in the stores. You know, this is just one of our jars that we do. We do 22 on the store shelves. And I personally, I've added a few of my own things in it beside being fair trade, beside being organic, beside the bottle being recyclable, non-GMO. Okay. So uh, what does that mean in tea? Like what, where, what ingredients have GMOs in tea? Wait a second. Genetically changed. Things that are genetically changed. That they I know, I know. But are there, which ingredients in teas are most susceptible to GMOs? I guess or have, are most common, most commonly have GMOs. Um, marigold flowers, peppermint, they are genetically changed for a higher lead uh, yield of planting. Some even black teas that are grown in Argentina are hothouse and they're hybrids. So you're not even getting Camellia senescens anymore. You're getting a hybrid of a hybrid of a hybrid. It goes into your system and now you're a hybrid. You know, you're not, that's what it's about, non-GMO. You're drinking something and genetically formulating into your system a whole other product that you thought you were drinking and eating. So um, there are a whole list, and if anyone has any questions on it, they could email me at t, the letter T, salon, S-A-L, sales, uh, at gmail.com, and I'll gladly have part of our staff answer that because we're constantly researching what's new, what shouldn't we drink? What should we drink? What crops are being picked this year? What Darjeeling's are better this year? Because remember, you're dealing with a product that's grown naturally. Some of them. I pick. The estates I pick are non-GMO. That are 75% organic. Not everything is organic. Very expensive to join the club. But mm -hmm. almost 80% are natural already. I don't think you have to like... <gasps> It doesn't say organic. I'm not eating it or drinking it. So you think the GMO is more important than the organic issue? 
I do a little bit. I do. Genetically changed things are so different than natural and organic. 90% of the tea is natural today. It really is. I mean, they don't, they're not going up 14,000 feet to spray a tea plant. They're just not. I mean, they might put marigolds in the middle of their estate. They might put gems, crystals in the middle. They might grow something else that you get a fruity flavor next to it. But the truth is that in all the years of 23 years that I've gone to all these countries, China, Japan, to India, Darjeeling, Sri Lanka, and I go to Assam, they're not spraying. Argentina, yes. You got Indonesia, maybe. I won't give away countries, but they do, and you just have to be, who do you buy your meat from? Who is your butcher? Where do you get your fish from? Know your vendors. Understand their consciousness and their passion and their desire of clarity that they know the market. And that's why we're still a very you know, successful artisanal company, because we stand in the forthright of American Business Sustainable Council. I speak on it. I serve on their council. We're at the White House November 13th, you know, serving tea to the White House. You know, I mean, we are there. I mean, I do have a lot of fun with it, though. I am doing the Philly Food and Wine weekend of October 18th, and I'm mixing tea and vodka. So what? So for people at home who can't, you know, taste your tea at the White House, which is, I assume, the vast majority, um, what would be your one recommendation besides drinking tea in the first place to you know improve their the ritual at home uh, and use tea as kind of a, a healing aid for the mind body and spirit first you have to go to your cupboard you have to see what you've had for how long have you had it have you had it for a year or two you first have to go back to the beginning of time of your habits you have to go into your cupboard and look at the product you've had and if you had it over a year, I'm sorry to say, throw it out. You have to clean your refrigerator of old stuff that you might have had, like iced teas for the last two weeks. Gone. Sorry. Iced teas, three days. Cupboards, a year, have to be cleaned out. So these are important essences of first starting off by making sure you're starting your day off with the cupboard that's holding ingredients that will help and make a difference into your life. And then add in slowly, one tea at a time. You don't need to have go to the market today and go to fairways and drive them crazy. I need tea salon. I need every one of their teas. You don't need to do that. You just need to start with one. Drink it in the morning or drink it whatever time it works for you, whatever time that is, and then add another that you might like at night. Add another like Upaya. I did a tea for Roshi Halifax. She's an amazing Zen uh, monk out of uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And her center is called Upaya. And I work with her with Donna Karen. She, uh, Donna Karen introduced me to her at that year process of life at Urban Zen. And, she, and uh, she came to me and said, I'd love a tea at Upaya. So we, since that day, it's been four years, we have it on every shelf. It's a rooibos base grown in Western Africa. No caffeine, raslet berry leaves, beetroot, ginger, and oranges. It's amazing. I just bottled it for uh, the Red Rabbit, which serves 18,000 meals a day to the charter school system. Mm. The kids are drinking orange juice, apple juice that are pasteurized with sugar. So I just introduced it to the school system. And, you know, that's what you need to do. Just do it slowly. Don't run out the door tomorrow morning, but first look at your cupboard. See okay. what you have today that you need to get rid of that's not working in your system. I like that. All right, so this may be repetitive, but I ask every single guest on Wellness Wednesday um, to tell me if they could tell someone one thing to change about their lifestyle that doesn't have a huge financial impact, but would have a benefit to their general well-being, what would it be? And I know you I know you want to say tea, but traveling tea. around and learning from all these different doctors, maybe there's another little tidbit in there. Well, you know, this morning, it's interesting you should ask this. This morning I was sitting, I, we moved our warehouse to Woodstock, uh, Kingston, New York. So we're upstate in the Catskills. And it's the most gorgeous time of year, all the trees. And I met one of my dearest old friends, Paul Bloom, for breakfast this morning, and 
he's amazing. He's a Qigong teacher. He teaches Qigong for over the last 15 years. And I said to him this morning, you're getting ready for Yom Kippur, which is this Friday. And I said, what do you do every morning? And he said, I sit in meditation. I sit in quietness. I listen to my breath. I pay attention to that breath. I don't need a word. I don't need a place. I just find a moment in the morning. And I get into that quiet place and I gather my thoughts. And I gather that quietness and just listen to your breath. And I think if anybody wanted to start their day in the most magical way there is, is to just get quiet. And, you know, crystal pearls come to you in that quiet place. Decision making could come afterwards. But in that, if you just say not now, when something comes in your head like my teacher did, her name is Gulama, she would say, not now, Miriam, just get quiet. Not now, just be quiet. And that, to me, is the way to start your morning, just listening to your breath. And the Japanese do it by listening to their pot of water boiling. That's how they do it. They listen to the steam coming out of their kettle. And they know when it gets to that boiling point, they stop their meditation and they make a cup of tea. Oh, my God, I love that. Um, well, Miriam, thank you so much for taking the time to give us all your tea wisdom. And I hope everyone at home goes into their cupboard, clears out the cobwebs of their old nasty tea, and oh. starts to bring in one at a time um, a new tea that'll help them create a beautiful healing ritual. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. And, and enjoy being on, take a moment on my website and take a moment and call me if you have a question. I'm here. <laughs> So, you know, I love answering questions. I love communicating with the people that are out there that have it. So I'm there for you. Enjoy. Your Thank you for your Thanks, time. Thanks, Miriam. Thank you.